Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Chances are we'll make it about halfway through chapter 4 this morning. I'm just kidding. That's not going to happen. But Ephesians chapter 1, as we open up this book and we start to kind of read the introduction to the book of Ephesians, we realize very quickly that the Apostle Paul has a lot of information, a lot of big ideas to cram into a short period of space. Specifically, verses 3 through 14 act as the introduction to the book. Now, they don't act like an introduction like a table of contents would act, that here's what we're going to talk about first and second and third and fourth, and, and here's our conclusion. It doesn't introduce us to all the ideas in the book. What Paul does at the beginning of Ephesians is he introduces us to God. First and foremost, he wants us to know who God is, what he has given his people. Before Paul gets to the question, how should I behave? What should I do? What does life look like? The first question he wants to answer is, who is God? What has he given us? What can we understand about him? And then our lives will begin to take shape in that Jesus Christ. We talked about this a little bit on our Tuesday night group uh, this past Tuesday evening. We read from a little book called The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. The very first line in that book is a rather bold claim, but I think there's a lot of truth in it. He opens this book by saying this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's a bold claim, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. When we really dig into who we think God really is, what does God really do? What is he like? What is his relationship with creation and humanity like? It's going to give us insight into who we have become and who we are becoming. So it's critical for Paul that we try to get this clear understanding of who God is, and then life will follow. A lot of times people feel like, well, what's most important is not necessarily who God is. He's just kind of on the shelf or in the background. Maybe he's the creator but not involved. What's most important is that I just am a good person. I'm a decent person. I just do nice things. Is that all that we really need? Well, as far as the Apostle Paul is concerned, that's not at all the case. If I just want to be good without God, who is my standard? Well, my standard becomes nothing but me. If I need to become better, what power do I use to get better? Well, I really have very little of my own power to do that. I need the power of God. So you see, guys, God has not left us to our own devices. He's not left us to our own resources. He's not left us to our own power. But God he has come among us to lead us to himself. So Paul's first description of God in this introduction is of the big ideas of who God is and what God does. And here's what Paul does in this introduction and some of what we will deal with this morning. Paul opens with praise. He begins with praise and adoration. The first thing he says in verse 3 is, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He opens with praise. He's actually going to finish this introduction with praise as well. But he wants us to know that God should be praised for who he is and all that he has given to us. So he opens with adoration. And then we're going to talk about God giving gifts to his people. In many ways, this is how this introduction is structured. This is what God has given, and now this is what he wants out of our lives as a result. So what are the gifts that he gives? What does God give? Why do I need it? What do I do with it? And then here's what we're going to talk about specifically this morning about the gifts that God gives us. God chooses us, and God adopts us into his family. These are massive and magnificent truths about God. It is God's initiation that we become a part of his family. It is God's decision that you and I are his sons and his daughters. And we're going to discover through the Apostle Paul that the reason for all of that is that we would make much of God, that God would be glorified for all that he has done. So let's begin reading Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. I'm going to read all the way through verse 10. 
And we'll get through a portion of that. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Now stick with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to his riches, the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, all things in heaven and things on earth. Reading this whole thing in one sort of standing and sitting is a little bit daunting because what Paul has done is he has layered idea on top of idea on top of idea. And the moment we feel like, oh, I think I've got a hold of that phrase or that idea, he immediately says, so that and in that, and here's this and here's that, and it just boom, 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 boom. Now, don't get overwhelmed and daunted by this passage because a lot of these ideas will get fleshed out through the rest of the book. A lot of these ideas we're going to focus on and make sure that we make sense of what Paul is talking about. But I know it's daunting, but I would also encourage you to do this. Because this passage of Scripture is so rich, as we go through the book of Ephesians, sit down and slowly work through verses 3 through 14 and just kind of soak in it for a little while. Let these concepts sort of roll into your heart and mind <clears throat> because they're going to unfold through the book. They're going to unfold through this series. And I believe you're going to begin to see and hear things from God as you just kind of let a passage like this soak in your soul, your heart, in your mind. So stick with it as we go through a passage of Scripture like this. Now, we finished last week with, the, with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And I want to come back to that verse to make sure we understand it before we move on to the rest of the passage. Paul begins this letter here with praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's biblical language for let all praise be to God for, and on and on and on it goes. So the first phrase of the introduction is let all praise be to God. If you look at the end of verse 14, the last phrase of verse 14 is to the praise of his glory. It begins with praise. It ends with praise. Everything is about how great God is and that we would actually recognize that. So God is worthy to be blessed for ev giving us everything that we need. I love this phrase. God has given us a handful of spiritual blessings, some of which come from heavenly places. It's not what he says. He has given us, guys, this is stunning Every spiritual blessing from heavenly places. Everything that God could possibly give you, he's given you from himself, from his presence, from his glory. He has given you and me everything. That's stunning. These are gifts that actually come from him and that can only accomplish what God's kinds of gifts can accomplish. Now, we just came through a gift-giving season we love giving gifts to each other. We do a lot of this, and we reciprocate our gifts, and someone gives us a gift, and we think, well, how much was that? Because now I have to give another gift back to them. I have to write thank you notes. We go through a lot of that sort of thing, right? Now, some of these gifts that we give are nice, and they're pleasant, and they're a token of friendship or relationship. Sometimes we're able to give gifts to people that are actually quite significant. Maybe not necessarily something that's just a lot of money, but a lot of time and effort, and it's deeply personal, and it, it actually touches on something that's really important. And we can actually give really meaningful gifts as well. But listen, none of us can give gifts that come from the presence and divine um, action of God. 
We can't give heavenly gifts. None of the gifts that we give, guys, can touch eternity. None of the gifts that we give can save our souls. None of the gifts that we give can redeem a broken life and put it back together again. None of these gifts will last into eternity. Only the kinds of gifts that God gives will do that. So Paul is absolutely in awe of what God has done. And he, want to, he wants to make sure that you and I see it as well. So if he says he's given you every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, well, what are these blessings? What are these gifts? So that's then immediately what Paul begins to do. Here's the gift. He begins to talk about these things specifically. So here's what he says now in verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. God chose us. I hope, and I've been praying, that these concepts sink into us in a new kind of way this morning. God chose us. It's stunning. Guys, absolutely everyone who puts their trust in Jesus Christ, becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, is saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, has become a part of the chosen people of God. And it's not just that. Paul says he, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Long before you and I even had the opportunity to choose for God or choose against God or put off the choice of, of God himself, long before any of that happened, God chose us. It's profound what happens when we actually understand this thought. The dominant verse in verse, or excuse me, the dominant verb in verses 3 through 10 is this verb to choose. It's right at the beginning of Paul's sets of thoughts about what these gifts are like and what they do. So it's not just the dominant verb, but it becomes the dominant thought through the rest of this section as well. So Paul grabs this phrase, God chose us. Scripture often speaks of the people of God as God's chosen people. So when Paul grabs this language, it's deeply meaningful to him. It's deeply meaningful to anyone who has been raised in the Old Testament, who is a biological descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They have learned through the Old Testament that they are the chosen people of God. So Paul grabs that concept that's so important in the Old Testament, and he pulls it right into the New Testament, and he applies it to the church of Jesus Christ. And he says that we now are the chosen people of God. Now, here's a lot of what this language does, what this understanding of God does for us. First of all, it does this. It puts the initiative in God's hands. He's the one who chooses. He's the one who does. He's the one who reaches out. He's the one who communicates first. He's the one who sends his son, Jesus Christ. He's the one who sends the third member of the, the, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. God is the initiator in all of this. So he chose us, meaning it is his will. It is his desire. It is what God wants that we would belong to him. How does God choose? What standard does he use? Because the kind of choosing that God does is a little crazy in human terms. It's a little strange. Now, if you and I <clears throat> were to assemble around us a team of friends and people who are going to help us through a situation or to deal with something or to walk through life with, 
We typically would choose a group of people based on a set of standards. What kind of merits, what kind of qualifications, what kind of licensure do they have? Maybe they have the wallet that we need. Maybe they have the network that we need. And so we're choosing people based on these kinds of standards. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong in every situation. Life is just full of choosing moments that are like that. So we tend to choose based on standards. Are they like me? Do they like me? Do I like them? Do they have what I need? We make these kinds of decisions. Now, how many of you would change the members of the family that you belong to? Okay, yeah, okay, I see a couple hands. Let's be careful with that, right? (laughs) You see, there's choosing, and then there's what we've been given. We have been chosen versus choosing. So we tend to have standards that we choose by. God does it differently. Guys, listen to this. God makes his choice based on his good and free will. That's how God chooses, based on his good, free will. Even more than that, the standard that God uses to choose us is his love. That's the standard God uses to choose you. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. There's this really cool passage of Scripture buried early on in the book of Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 7, and God is actually talking to his people about this very issue. And here's how he talks to the nation of Israel. Here's how he talks to his chosen people. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 and 6 to 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are face of the earth, out of every conceivable ethnicity, every conceivable empire, He has chosen you of everyone who's on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. It wasn't because you were Egypt or Babylon or Rome. That's not why. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you. And he is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. I pulled you out of slavery. I took you from Egypt. I brought you to the promised land, not because there's a lot of you, not because a lot of you are tremendous, but because I love you. God chose us, Paul says. Now listen to this. God's sovereign power initiates the call. His eternal and loving character provides the reason for the call. Where in this do you and I fit? Do we start the call? Are we the reason for the call in terms of we've done enough good things to deserve the love of God? We are nothing but glorious and and grateful recipients of what God has done. His sovereign power initiates His love is the reason for the call of His people. So we say things like this a lot. When we talk about grace, when we talk about salvation and how it works, we say things like this. We can never earn this gift. We can't do enough good deeds to earn this gift. And that is absolutely true. God says, I didn't choose you because you people were mighty and powerful and you had your economic and military act together. That's not why I chose you. I chose you because I just love you. That's it. So we can't do enough things to achieve this goal. So we say that kind of thing a lot. A good Bible teaching church is going to remind its people of that little detail when it comes to salvation over and over again. So we say that, but I want us to turn that thought around and look at it from the other side. If, in fact, we are chosen by our good behavior, that obligates God to us. It's a little bit like saying, 
I can do enough good deeds here, 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 and then all of a sudden I've hit that break point. I've hit the point in the teeter-totter where it's going to start to go down the other direction. I've done enough good things that now God is forced to accept me into heaven. Most people live with that concept of salvation. I am a good enough person. When I die, God will allow me into his heaven. That is placing an obligation of God that I have no right to place upon God. God is not at my beck and call. God is not at my command. He does as he chooses in his sovereign, eternal, omnipotent power, which makes the gift that he gives so stunning. He just chooses us because he loves us. We place no obligation on him. We don't require him to choose us because we've done a certain amount of things. He just loves you. I love this thought. Some of you are thinking, Pastor Phil, you're ducking the question. Paul talks about choosing and predestination. That's why we're going to skip right to the next verse. No. (laughs) God chooses us. Paul uses the term predestination. Does that then mean that God predestines individuals to go to heaven or hell? News at 11. (laughs) Here's how the concept of being chosen works in Scripture. Remember, Paul is grabbing this idea. He's using this language because this is how he was raised. This is how the Old Testament talks about God's relationship to his people. In the Old Testament, every time the language of God's chosen people or God choosing his people is used, it's used with the people, not individuals. It speaks of the nation of Israel. It speaks of the biological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it always applies to the group. When Paul pulls the language of choosing and predestination into the New Testament, he now just does not speak of the biological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He now speaks of the group that is the church. In fact, he says in the book of Galatians, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God now has chosen the church as a matter of belief in Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, God's chosen people, the the, the people who belong to the nation of Israel, here's part of what can happen. It is entirely possible for an individual to cease loving and worshiping the God of Israel and to begin worshiping other false gods. This is a lot of the reason why the prophets show up to remind the people of God of their obligation to worship God. They're worshiping other gods so they will succumb to the judgments of God. So that means of the people of God, individuals can leave. Now, there's also this sense that the people of God in the Old Testament are are a nation of priests. They're intended to leave this door open so that others can actually come into the people of God, cease worshiping false gods, begin worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the story of the book of Ruth, a Moabitess, who says, I will now worship your God and become a part of your people. And so it is with the church. God has chosen us. Many of you will remember in the book of Hebrews, we found this warning over and over. The writer of Hebrews kept saying, be careful that you don't fall away from the faith. There's this warning of those who belong to Jesus Christ. Don't fall away from the faith. But then the apostle Paul in Ephesians In almost every book that he writes, he tells the people he writes to, I need you to pray for me because we are constantly inviting people into the church of Jesus Christ. Everywhere we go, even if I am in chains in prison, I need courage and wisdom to speak the things of God. So it is part of our task to talk about Jesus with the people that we know to invite them into the chosen people of God. Here's how Paul puts that prayer in the book of Colossians chapter 4. At the very same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. It is meaningful 
that Paul warns us against falling away, and it's meaningful that Paul encourages every one of us to talk to others about Jesus Christ so that they can accept him as Lord and Savior and join the chosen people of God. So Paul says, now he has chosen you. He's chosen us before the foundation of the world that we should be, in verse 4, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We are chosen so that we should be holy and blameless before him. If there is a certain kind of pattern that helps make sense of the density of this introduction, it's this pattern. God gives a gift, and then there's an intended outcome. Here's what God has given us, and here's now what should happen in our lives as a result. Here's what He gives. Here's what happens. So every gift given is one of these kinds of gifts that Pastor Brooks talked about a couple weeks ago that has an intended outcome to it. Now, discovering that God has already reached out to me, that God has already called me to become a part of His family, all of this, he says, should lead us down a life of a, a path of a certain kind of lifestyle, a lifestyle of what I'm going to call this morning lived gratitude, to finally come to the realization that God chose me because he loves me. Now my life turns into actual gratitude, lived gratitude for what God has given me. We can express gratitude through the things that we say, and we can live gratitude as well. It is deeply important to express it. In fact, this is a lot of what we do when we gather and we sing together and we worship together. A lot of our songs is full of this kind of language, thanksgiving language, adoration language, praise kind of language. This is part of what we do when we gather. We literally express it. We actually do damage to relationships, and we do damage to ourselves when we don't express gratitude. Selfishness grows. Gratitude diminishes. Humility diminishes. We actually do damage when we don't express it. So we express gratitude to God. Blessed be, right, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And often being able to express our gratitude is actually a powerful first step in recognizing the depth and the power of the gift that God has given us. So we express gratitude. But then Paul also says we are intended to live out gratitude as well. If we think that by expressing our gratitude to God, our praise to God, we can get out of actually doing anything about it, Paul is going to say, then you don't understand what you've been given. You don't understand now the life that God has breathed into you by His Holy Spirit. If you've decided, I can just accept the things of Christ, die and go to heaven, that's all I need. Paul says, you don't understand the gift. It's so that we would live holy and blameless lives before Him. Now remember something that we said at the very beginning of this sermon God has not left us to our own power. He hasn't left us to our own devices. He doesn't save us and then say, good luck with that. <laughs> Do the best that you can. That's not how it works. Guys, this is, again, another stunning reality of what we're learning about God. What God calls us to be, God will do within us. What God calls us to be, God will do within us. Here's another way of putting that. And I phrase this a little oddly so that maybe it will sort of stick just a little bit. But this is, this is what I mean. To be called by God is to begin being transformed by God. What He's called us to do, He's going to start doing within us. As we submit ourselves to Him, as we turn our lives toward Him, as we pay attention to Him, He's actually designed it so that His Holy Spirit begins to bear the fruit of the Spirit instead of the fruit of Phil. I know what life is like when Phil's fruit is born and I don't want that anymore. I want the fruit of the Holy Spirit at work within me, within us. Guys, we're going to discover this pattern in Ephesians in powerful ways, and especially early on in chapter 2, we're really going to get a chance to dig into this, but this is important. 
God calls us to be his people. We accept this gift by faith. And now we are given God's Holy Spirit to begin the process of life change, to begin the process of discipleship, of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Paul says something like this when he writes to the church in Thessalonica. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul puts it like this. And again, listen to how the language works here. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good in every work of faith by his power. This is what I'm praying for for you people. That God will make you worthy of what he's called you into. And that everything that you and I resolve to do that is good, that is right in the sight of God, I am praying that more and more it is the power of God that does that inside of us. It is the sovereign power of God that begins the call. It is the eternally good and loving nature of God that is the reason for the call. And then it is the power of God that lives out the call as well. It's about God. It's about God. It's about God. Paul keeps on talking about what God has given us. And what he intends, right at the very end of verse 4, that goes like this. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved in Jesus Christ. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself. You fiddled with this notion of calling and predestination, so I want to think for a second about the concept of adoption. If you're sensitive to this word in term, you're going to find Paul talking about adoption and inheritance actually several times through the book of Ephesians. So again, he raises this concept here, but it becomes important to our lives as he continues to make his way through the book of Ephesians. So when Paul talks about adoption, right? So God has chosen us. God has adopted us into his family. The term that Paul uses for adoption here is nearly the same concept that you and I have when we talk about adoption. It's really important sometimes to make sure we try to think like Paul when we read him or when we try to think like his original readers as they would understand these ideas or these terms. Now, given the way that family structure worked, especially in the Greek and Roman worlds, adoption was a real thing, but it was primarily a legal matter. Now, it's still a legal matter. We still go before a judge. We still sign a paper. A child becomes a part of the family who is not biologically related, but now is related to us legally, so to speak. So it was in Paul's world, but it was primarily legal. We need an heir to handle the estate when the patriarch is dead, so we're going to bring this person in. We adopt this person, and they become an heir. Now, that concept is in here in Scripture, that you and I are brought into God's family, and we now inherit the kingdom of God. (laughs) Everything that is our Father's is now given to us. That itself is stunning. Remember, it's not some spiritual blessings. It's everything in his house now is yours. And then Paul adds this quirky little word to it. It becomes so important to the life of the early church. In fact, it's a word, the way in which it is used by Paul in the New Testament church, it changes the world. He doesn't just say that God predestined us to be adopted into himself, Paul makes sure that we understand that this happens in love. Yes, it's legal, but it's also a matter of the love of God. This is more and more how we understand adoption now. 
the extension not just of some sort of legal covering, but the extension of the love of a family that draws someone and says, because we love you, you are now ours. Now, again, there's this stunning dynamic that happens in adoption. Adoption doesn't happen by the will of the child. Adoption happens by the will of the parent. No matter how much the child wants it, the child can't sign the papers that makes them part of this family. It is the parents who reach out and sign the papers and say, you are ours. Even adoption as his sons and daughters is the initiation of the love of God shown toward every one of us. Here's how John the disciple puts it as he's describing Jesus Christ in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he says this, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right. He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of the will of God, he chose you because he loves you. Born by the will of God. So what is the outcome of this beautiful thought that in love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace. The outcome of our adoption as sons and daughters is the greatness of God. It is the glory of God. God chooses us, makes us his children, so that we then can make him great. So that we then can reveal the greatness, the manifold wisdom and love of God to everyone around us. It is about the glory of God. Guys, the more we recognize what God has done, the more our lives are about God and the more he is seen for the gracious and glorious God that he truly is. And when that happens, guys, it's not just God, but our own lives grow in meaning and purpose and resonance with the divine gifts of God, the more we live for the glory of God. This is an important anecdote, not anecdote, antidote. (laughs) This is an important antidote to the fundamental selfishness that is inside of the American church. The fundamental meanness that is inside of the American church, this is an important thing for us to hear. This is the antidote to our spiritual selfishness that we have been brought into God's family not to express or exercise me or my selfishness, but to express the glory and the greatness of God. And the more we learn to do that, the greater these lives become. That's the overflow of making God great instead of making us great. Something struck me this week, and I thought, well, maybe I should tell this story. I kind of prayed it through, and I thought, you know, I should should say this. I'm going to peel back the veil just just a little bit on, on, on Phil. Not that that's exciting, but... There's something that I think is, is important here. I have been, um, I've been a pastor of one sort or another. I've been preaching and teaching for almost 30 years now. I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. I'll let you do the math on that. I've been doing this for a while now. And when I receive complaints about how I do what I do, Almost every single one of those complaints boil down to exactly the same thing. I have been receiving the same complaint about myself for 30 years now. Now, you would, be, you would think, now, if someone gets the same complaint that long, maybe it would sink in and they would decide, i got to change someone here. <clears throat> I was literally told once, a long time ago, and I've been told this in various fas- forms and fashions ever since, I was once told, quote, Phil, you can't just preach about the Bible all the time, end quote. I've been told over and over again, you got to get out of this thing. 
You got to stop talking about this thing. And the context is, or the conversation is always something like this. You need to be more emotional. You need to wrap people more up emotionally. We need to get out of here doing something or, you know, something like that. You need to be more political in what you say because these political things are important. This isn't important as, this isn't as important as the political stuff that is going on. Or, Phil, we need more of the six tips and tricks to this success kind of sermon series because that's what grows churches and that's what makes people happy. That's what brings them in. You can't just keep doing what you're doing. Why haven't I listened to that complaint? Because I don't think that's what you need. I don't think that's what I need. Guys, I don't need Phil to become a better version of Phil. I want what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus. He needs to increase I need to decrease. I don't need more of Phil. I need more of him. And when I read a passage like this, and when I spend time with a passage like this, I don't see how great Phil can become. I don't see how to reach my own potential in this life. I don't see how to win friends and influence people. I see I need to make much of God. I see this is what God has done. I can barely grasp it. But praise be to God with everything that I am. And when we do this, we, we get out of this small little box that is us, that is me. And we find ourselves in the greatness of the glory of God that is infinitely knowable and infinitely livable every day of our lives until we see him face to face. The greatest use of my life is God's glory. The greatest use of our lives is God's glory. We read this in worship, and here it is at the beginning of Psalm 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Not to us, but to you. Be glory for all that you are, for all that you have done. The way of the world turned in ourselves. It is common, it is natural to us to put ourselves and those who agree with us first and above all else this is what the way of the world always boils down to and it's full of brokenness and dysfunction and dead, ends way, dead end ways of life. But the way of Jesus Christ is a shock to our system. It puts God and His glory first and that's what puts the human experience back into touch with reality. Is when we learn how to put God first in all things. Guys, God calls you to take part in all of the gifts and advantages of his, of his family so that we together can make His name great. There is no other name worth making great. There is no one else who deserves this kind of praise and honor. There is no one else who gives these kinds of gifts to people who need them and don't deserve them, but who desperately need them. There is no other name that's worthy of this kind of glory. And God chooses His children long before they even know to call out to Him so that we can live out these kinds of lives together that we were designed by God to live in holiness and blameless before Him. This is how much you matter to the God who made you. He calls out to you to come to Him and to be saved and to be given everything that is in the Father's house. Let's pray.